Hello, my friends. This is Dr. Beter. Today is February 27, 1977, and this is my monthly AUDIO LETTER No. 21. For some time now I've been warning you of the dangers facing America. Now time is fast running out. When Jimmy Carter was inaugurated President on January 20, 1977, a contingency plan concocted in 1963 was set in motion, and it is progressing very rapidly. The key to this particular plan was to be the placement of a completely puppetized President in office at a time of rapidly mounting war threats. Under this plan, inadequate performance by the puppet Presidents in the face of these dire threats is intended to enable a takeover of the country by Rockefeller-controlled military and CIA inner circles. In this manner, the total dictatorship sought by the four Rockefeller brothers is to be brought into being. We are now faced with the planned threat of Nuclear War I, with the puppet President now on the scene in the person of Jimmy Carter. Carter continually spouts the Rockefeller line as he learned it from his participation in their Trilateral Commission, but he has no real grasp at all of what he is involved in. Meanwhile, the CIA is also being readied for its appointed role. Nelson Rockefeller has been busy packing key positions in the CIA with his new men and to facilitate the enlistment of required military support for the coming dictatorship, a military man who is a member of the Rockefeller Inner Circle, Admiral Stansfield Turner, has been selected to head the CIA. That's why the earlier nomination of Ted Sorensen ran into a brick wall. He ran afoul of a game plan he didn't even know about. The plan calls for pre-war crisis measures to be used to condition Americans to accept the elaborate transformation of America into a total dictatorship, and this pre-war buildup is going on right now. Ultimately, many millions of Americans are to be annihilated in a Soviet nuclear attack, which is to be carried out according to rules laid down in secret agreements negotiated by former Secretary of State Henry Kissinger. As I revealed in Monthly AUDIO LETTER No. 12 for May 1976, this joint Rockefeller-Soviet war plan includes a super-secret nuclear safe zone across the upper portion of the continental United States, within which the Rockefellers and their intimates plan to ride out the war on Mount Desert and Bartlett Islands off the coast of Maine, right in the heart of the Nuclear Safe Zone. This Nuclear Safe Zone is merely the Nuclear Age equivalent of the orders which were given to Allied bombing commands during World War II not to damage Rockefeller-owned strategic targets in Germany. These orders cause such huge important installations as the IG Farben chemical plants to survive unscathed all the way through World War II, while other targets and even whole cities nearby were completely leveled. Last month in Monthly AUDIO LETTER No. 20, I was able to reveal the club the Rockefeller brothers believe they hold over the heads of the Soviets to make sure the Soviet nuclear attack on America goes as planned. In this way, the Rockefellers will have used the Soviets to do their dirty work for them. In any event, this club consists of an undersea fleet of 14 super missiles targeted on the Soviet Union, five in the Pacific, nine in the Atlantic. These missiles are not under the control of our Defense Department and have nothing whatever to do with the defense of our country as a whole. They are under the direct control of the Rockefeller Brothers through their controlled CIA, and their only purpose is to make sure that the Rockefeller inner circles in America are not included in the Holocaust that is being arranged for the rest of us. If all goes as planned, 
The CIA super missiles deep in the ocean will never be fired at all. Only if there should be a Soviet double-cross would there be an attempt to fire them, and under those circumstances they would act only as vengeance weapons. Yet as awesome as these CIA super missiles are, they cannot prevent a Soviet double-cross. In fact, they have already provoked one double-cross. Last summer the Soviet Union sneaked in under the CIA missile umbrella and began planning short-range underwater-launched nuclear missiles in our own territorial waters, hoping to achieve such total surprise that the CIA undersea super missiles would never be fired. The limited exposure of this threat, which I was able to achieve by means of AUDIO LETTERS No. 14 and 15 for July and August 1976, was sufficient to ruin the Soviet surprise. So an attack at that time was averted. The Joint Rockefeller-Soviet War Plan is back on track for the time being, but now both sides are watching for a chance to double-cross each other. Meanwhile, as I reported last month, the presence of the Soviet missiles in our waters are now being incorporated into the Joint War Plan. For the first time in many years, civil defense, of which we have none, has again become the subject of wide concern. We are again hearing radio test alerts on the emergency broadcasting system which will be used in the event of war. It has even been hinted that we may soon experience unannounced air raid drills, a practice that could be especially effective in conditioning us all to the idea that war is imminent. Only a few days ago, on February 11, 1977, President Carter became the first President to fly with great publicity in a special airplane outfitted as a flying command post to be used in nuclear war. The article above this in the New York Daily News carried the headline, quote, Carter gets a preview of World War III. Unquote. Just a year ago such headlines would have been unthinkable. Now they are all around us. Because the plan now underway requires that military support be arranged for the new dictatorship, it was essential that General George S. Brown, Chairman of the Joint Chiefs of Staff, be neutralized, as I said he would be in Monthly AUDIO LETTER No. 17. General Brown played a pivotal role in preventing a Soviet nuclear surprise attack on the United States during August and September 1976, but that will not happen again, my friends. The campaign, which began in October 1976 to render General Brown ineffective in his efforts to protect America, have now succeeded. He is no longer able to influence events to any significant extent. That is why when Carter demanded on January 12, 1977, that studies be performed toward eliminating 75 to 80 percent of our intercontinental missiles, General Brown simply agreed to have the studies done. Can you imagine? My friends, now that we have lost General Brown, there is no one left in the entire United States Government to help us. There are still many patriotic individuals in the Government, of course, but they are not the ones in positions of power. Only massive public pressure, informed, angry, and determined, now has any chance of stopping the carefully planned war to kill millions of us and enslave the rest. Every one of us must work to bring about public awareness and pressure in whatever time we have left. But suppose we do not succeed. Then what? I believe the time has come to face that question squarely and honestly. It may well be that we have already failed in our efforts to help prevent Nuclear War I. Only God can know but we dare not give up 
because the victory may yet be ours. But the fact is that many Americans do not want to listen. They are not ready, and some will not be ready to listen until catastrophe comes upon their heads. If Nuclear War I does come here, my friends, millions will die, but there will also be some survivors. You owe it to yourself, to your family, and to our whole society to do whatever you can to be among the survivors. The godless dictatorship being fashioned by our unelected rulers will collapse in the end, and when it does, there must be people left who know what America was all about and what went wrong. Because you are willing to hear the truth now, before disaster arrives, you are that people. And if we are all forced to pass through the dark tunnel of war and bungling dictatorship, it will fall your lot to help lead our people out of darkness and into the sunlight once again on the other side. My three special topics for today are Topic No. 1, How Our National Security Was Really Lost. Topic No. 2, Pre-War America, 1977. And Topic No. 3, The End of an Era. Topic No. 1, For more than a generation, since the outbreak of World War II, in fact, Americans have been preoccupied with the idea of national security. But what is national security? One concept of national security is the familiar one promoted day in and day out by the Federal Government. According to the Government, national security is a matter that is just too complex for most of us to understand and must always be wrapped in secrecy, intrigue, and more secrecy. When we see diplomatic maneuvers which seem to help our enemies while harming our friends or even ourselves, we're always told we simply don't understand the so-called national security considerations that are involved. The map of the free world shrinks ever smaller. Our country grows visibly weaker and weaker, yet the Federal bureaucracy knows best, we are assured, and will take care of it all for us. But while you and I are both forced to pay the bill for it all, we are never, never let in on what it is really all about. What is called national security today by the government will be better described as security for our secret rulers. They see themselves as the embodiment of our nation, just as royalty did in times past. Thus to them, so-called national security is nothing more than a king's ex to prevent the public, you and me, from learning things about governmental doings that could endanger our rulers' security. The vital secrets that are routinely betrayed to our deadliest enemies are kept hidden from our view. The government's version of national security involves ever greater centralization of all power and all decision-making into just a few hands. Increasingly it involves spying on the citizens of our own nation and now it even includes diplomatic manipulations that have betrayed us straight down the road to Nuclear War I. This is what the words national security really mean to those who secretly control the United States Government, a government that used to be ours but is no more. What is called national security obviously is not what most of us naturally think of when we hear these words. The government's version of national security, in other words, is an illusion and a fraud. Real national security has to be rooted in the people who are the nation. When we think of national security, we usually think of the ability of the nation as a whole to protect itself from damage by other nations, politically, economically, and if need be, militarily. 
But there is another side to national security that is actually more basic, yet we in America have been led to gradually neglect it and finally lose it altogether over the past hundred years or so. I refer to the internal stability that has been destroyed by over-centralization. Gone are the days when America consisted of thousands of communities which could, if need be, survive for indefinite periods without supplies from distant sources. And gone are the days when consumers could choose from among a wide variety of products produced by true competitors. Instead, most of the things we now have to have for life come from somewhere else, often we know not where, and there is little competition or real choice left. The flow of essential commodities can now be turned off at will by the corporate socialists at a few central spigots in order to bring America to a grinding halt. Most Americans today never give this state of affairs a second thought. The young cannot imagine things being any different, and most of those who are old enough to remember a different way of life are willing to settle for what we have today with the comforts and luxuries that have become commonplace. What has happened, my friends, is that we have all become addicts. There is an addiction that underlies our entire way of life today, and this same addiction has made it possible for us to be brought to the threshold of totalitarian world government and nuclear holocaust. My friends, we are addicts, addicts to energy. There's no precedent in history for the magnitude of the suffering man can now bring about, because there's no precedent in history for the energy addiction that now grips America and the world. For thousands of years mankind got by on the ancient and renewable forms of energy such as animal power water power, wind power, and the burning of wood. Then came coal and the Industrial Revolution was spawned. But it was petroleum, thanks to its great convenience and high energy output, that was destined to make true energy addicts of us all. It is typical of addictions that they take time to develop. And that is true of our energy addiction of today. It began very gradually over 100 years ago and has built up over several generations. During the early years after petroleum first made its appearance, we were still in the take-it-or-leave-it stage, but gradually it found more and more uses, and then whole technologies were spawned which depend specifically on petroleum energy, such as the automobile and the airplane. These technologies gradually took on the character of necessities rather than optional luxuries, and from that point onward we were true addicts. The same way our energy addiction expanded to include dependence on natural gas and electricity. Even our food production became increasingly dependent upon uninterrupted supplies of non-renewable energy. The American farmer Blessed already with a rich land, began to retire his ox-drawn plow in favor of a gasoline-powered tractor, and soon expanded his productivity still further with other farm machinery, all of it run by petroleum energy. It became possible for fewer farmers to feed us all, and farmers who failed to keep up with these new trends, whether for financial reasons or otherwise, gradually disappeared from the scene. Then came high-yield hybrid crops, petroleum derivative insecticides and fungicides to protect these delicate hybrids from damage, and fertilizers made with natural gas as a raw material in order to make them grow better. Farms became bigger, fewer, and more expensive, huge agribusinesses energy-intensive and geared for high productivity began to dominate American agriculture, making it still harder for the small family farm to compete. Meanwhile, 
Petroleum energy made possible fast freight transportation over long distances. High-volume food distributors have exploited this in such a way that nearby small suppliers of many foods are bypassed in favor of a few centralized huge supply sources far away. This, of course, has caused many of the nearby supplies that used to exist in many areas to dry up and disappear. For example, every town of any size used to have access to one or more local dairies which processed the milk produced by cows in that area, but today many of the familiar, dependable local dairies of the past are gone, and if you can find anyone who can tell you where the milk you buy comes from, you may well discover that it comes from a central processing plant in another state. We have now reached the point where practically all the necessities of life including food and water, reach us only by means of non-renewable, centrally controlled energy. The energy pushers have done their job well, making it appear that nothing more than natural trends were at work. They have fed our addiction beyond the point of no return, taking care not to allow competing sources of energy to develop that could get out of their control and ruin their grip on us. Our energy addiction is now to be used against us for their own purposes. When we're told now that we must conserve, it means that we must knuckle under to sacrifices as we are gradually ground under the heel of artificial shortages and rising costs. My friends, the role of energy in our society is so all-pervasive today that it is hard to describe. And it is the Rockefellers who first realized how powerful a tool it could be for their own ends. John D. Rockefeller, Sr. built the giant Standard Oil monopoly with ruthless determination to corner the market on petroleum. The trust-busting era merely caused him to devise better ways to hide his control while his program proceeded without let-up, and soon the Rockefeller Standard Oil Empire became involved in international intrigue and wars to overcome foreign competitors as well. The process has continued down to the present, with wars, skirmishes, coups, and so forth enabling the Rockefeller Empire to maintain a stranglehold on most of the world's oil. In recent years, this has been made virtually airtight through control of most of the free world's refining capacity. So today it is the four Rockefeller brothers who are in a position to turn off the vital energy supplies to which we have become addicted for our very lives. We have all become so accustomed to the steady supply of electricity, natural gas, and petroleum products that the illusion of reliability has been created. Alternative means of surviving by means of local resources have gradually fallen into the disuse and have disappeared, while we all have been lulled into a life or death dependence on centralized energy sources controlled by the Rockefeller Brothers. And they are not interested in your security or mine. Their horizon is the world and how to control it, not the mere survival of America. Therefore when they turn the energy spigots off, as they are beginning to do now, they will be turning off our national security with it. In other words, we have no national security. So long as the necessities of life remain under the centralized control of men, who are determined to murder our beloved country, we will never again have true national security. Only if we the people will rise up and take back the government that has been stolen from us will the many things be done that are necessary to restore true national security to our land. Topic No. 2 when I recorded my audio book tape on the coming Depression and War in October 1974, I explained the real purpose that caused World Wars I and II. In both cases, 
Germany was nothing more than a huge pawn in an ever bigger game of international conquest. Instead, as I said then, through two world wars America's secret rulers brought Great Britain to her knees. The American people as a whole feel strong kinship to the British. So it seems incredible that our secret rulers would have deliberately smashed Britain through war. But listen to what former Prime Minister Sir Harold Wilson said last month on January 22, 1977 on a television talk show. When he was asked to explain the economic crisis Britain is in, he said, quote, Two world wars took all our investments and the Lend-Lease Agreement with the Americans not only took all our markets, which was justified as we didn't want shipping going to Latin America, but we had to give them all our inventions." Unquote. Thus the three decades from the beginning of World War I to the end of World War II were used to concentrate the bulk of the world's economic might into the hands of those who ruled America secretly behind the scenes namely the Rockefellers. The technologies and markets of friend and foe alike were stolen and poured into the coffers of the corporate socialist empire controlled by the four Rockefeller brothers. But this emergence of America into sudden world dominance was never intended to be more than a temporary phenomenon by those who had secretly caused it to happen. A dominant share of the economic and technological might of the world had been centralized under American control so that we could then serve as an immense reservoir for transfusions to the Soviet Union. The godless dictatorship set up by the Bolsheviks in Russia in 1917 with the help of Rockefeller financing was to be the real wave of the future. It represented the ultimate in monopoly total control over every aspect of people's lives. But the Soviet system, which is intended as the pattern for total world domination, is artificial and unnatural, and that is why the Soviet Union had to be built up by massive transfusions from outside, transfusions of money, food, economic and technological know-how, everything. Now the transfusions are virtually complete. It took three decades to drain Britain and Europe to build up America as a reservoir for the Soviet Union, and it has taken three more decades to drain the American reservoir and make the Soviet Union the world's most powerful nation in material terms. The United States is now following Great Britain down the road to ruin, and for the same reasons. The Rockefeller brothers and their intimates now arrogantly believe they can no longer be stopped in their plan of world conquest. They are convinced there is no power greater than themselves, and they are becoming more brazen by the day. Jimmy Carter has been programmed to proceed with all possible speed in dismembering what remains of our nation's defenses, while at the same time promoting public awareness of war tensions here and abroad. He is making the terrible mistake of thinking he is actually President. Meanwhile, Longtime Rockefeller agent Walter Mondale stands ready and waiting for the moment if and when Jimmy Carter is erased from the scene. Mondale is by far the most powerful Vice President in history next to Nelson Rockefeller, and he is in a position to pick up the reins of Presidential power at a moment's notice. As for Nelson Rockefeller, he hasn't given up either. After a recent White House ceremony at which he was given an award, Rockefeller whispered to reporters as he left, I'll be back. Jimmy Carter is functioning with a skeleton government at the present time here in Washington. Huge gaps remain deliberately unfilled in the Carter Administration, such as the Chairmanship of the United States Export-Import Bank. Normally positions at XM Bank are among the most coveted plums in all of Washington. And yet up to now 
they remain unfilled. Why? Because, my friends, the Export-Import Bank is a peacetime operation, and it will be shut down when war comes as it is planned to do. The Carter Cabinet is a war cabinet, and the unprecedented measure was taken of rushing their confirmation hearings through Congress even before Carter took office. On hand to preside over America's final destruction in Nuclear War I are men of unchallenged qualifications for that task, such as Secretary of State Vance, Secretary of Defense Brown, and National Security Advisor Brzezinski, among others. These men were in the forefront of those who argued in favor of America's involvement in the disaster called Vietnam and help guide the conduct of the war in such a way as to guarantee our defeat. Now all they have to say about Vietnam is, quote, we made a mistake, unquote, and with that our country has been placed in their hands once again. We hear continually about government reorganization, but what does this really mean? For one hint, consider the fact that Brzezinski is on record as saying, quote, The reality of our times is such that a modern society such as the United States needs a central coordinating and renovating organ which cannot be made up of 600 people, unquote. In other words, the United States Congress in its present form is obsolete and should be replaced by something else. Brzezinski, by the way, is a close neighbor and associate of David and Nelson Rockefellers at Seal Harbor, Maine. And then there are the words of Andrew Young, appointed United States Ambassador to the UN by Carter. In that position, Young is charged with speaking for everyone in the United States, yet he has said, quote, Communism has never been a threat to me, unquote. Do words like that speak for you, my friends, or for your neighbors, or for any real American? But those words have been allowed to stand, and the man who said them is still the United Nations Ambassador. We are moving rapidly toward the introduction of the secret new Rockefeller Constitution for America which I revealed and described in AUDIO BOOK TAPE RELEASED IN JULY 1975. The plan is now to accomplish this as part of the scenario now underway to take over the country under threat of war. Even Carter's new CIA Director, Admiral Turner, has been in contact with Carter for over five years, not about military matters but governmental reorganization. And so, our unelected rulers continue to plan and scheme to take full advantage of the threat of war and even Nuclear War I itself to destroy our way of life for their own purposes. The orchestrated pre-war buildup of tensions continues. In recent weeks, Western Europe has suddenly been highlighted as our Nuclear Age Dunkirk because doubts are now being expressed that NATO forces there could withstand a surprise attack by the Warsaw Pact forces. And here at home it is now officially acknowledged that the Soviet Union is shooting for military superiority over the West. Unofficially, some say, they already have it. Worse yet, the Rockefeller-controlled CIA just happens to have been grossly underestimating the Soviet military buildup for a decade or more, can you imagine? Suddenly now we are told that the Soviet Union has been spending four times the previous CIA estimates for new weapons and military installations. The deliberate underestimates, which were arranged for years by Rockefeller insiders in the CIA, had just one purpose, to undermine any arguments about a serious Soviet threat, and thereby to ensure a decline in American military might. But now that Nuclear War I is imminent, the CIA estimates can no longer make any difference in our preparedness, 
So now the estimates have suddenly been raised in order to demoralize us and convince us that defeat at Soviet hands is all but inevitable. Having arranged for our constitutional military forces to be weakened as much as possible, the CIA itself has become the most powerful military organization in the United States, a fact symbolized by the fact that the CIA will now be headed by four-star Admiral Turner, a Rockefeller insider who will retain his military rank. The CIA has been transformed into a combined super-military and secret police controlled by persons loyal only to the Rockefeller Brothers instead of the country as a whole. This is in complete violation of the original charter of the CIA and of the Constitution of the United States. Sixteen years after the establishment of the CIA at the instigation of David Rockefeller, former President Harry S. Truman expressed public regrets over having done so. On December 21, 1963, he wrote for the Washington Post, quote, For some time I've been disturbed by the way the CIA has been diverted from its original assignment. It has become an operational and at times a policy-making arm of the government." Unquote. Saying that he had never visualized, quote, peacetime cloak and dagger operations, unquote, for the CIA, he added, and I quote, This quiet intelligence arm of the President has been so removed from its intended role that it is being interpreted as a symbol of sinister and mysterious foreign intrigue and a subject for Cold War enemy propaganda." Unquote. These words of President Truman were published just a month after an American President, John F. Kennedy, had been brutally removed from office by a successful CIA operation, as I revealed in Monthly AUDIO LETTER No. 3 for August 1975. Already the CIA had broken free of Presidential control, and a decade later a CIA operation called Watergate replaced an elected President and Vice President with appointees for the very first time in American history. Today the United States is surrounded by 90 short-range underwater-launched nuclear missiles planted by the Soviet Union within our own territorial waters. Our constitutional military services have been under Presidential orders since October 1, 1976, not to remove them, and now that General Brown has been neutralized, no effort whatever is being made to do so. And the only real counter-threat to these Soviet underwater missiles are the fleet of 14 awesome super-missiles targeted on the Soviet Union from resting places deep in the Atlantic and Pacific Oceans. These undersea super-missiles, as I revealed last month in AUDIO LETTER No. 20, are not under normal military control, but are under direct Rockefeller command through their controlled CIA. Their purpose, as I have already explained, is not to prevent NUCLEAR WAR ONE or even to retaliate when it comes. Their purpose is only to ensure that the Soviet Union abides by the joint Rockefeller-Soviet war plan to spare the Rockefeller Brothers and their intimates while incinerating the rest of us. But as I revealed last month, the super-secret CIA missiles have begun deteriorating and leaking. One missile in the Pacific is totally disabled, and several others are leaking plutonium from their warheads into the surrounding waters and probably are useless also. One of the leaking missiles which I mentioned last month is Atlantic Missile No. 8, which is located in the ocean about 290 miles east southeast of Jacksonville, Florida. On February 7, 1977, just two weeks after I recorded Monthly AUDIO LETTER No. 20, the beach near Jacksonville, Florida became the scene of a mystifying phenomenon. For no apparent reason, 
whales suddenly began beaching themselves in large numbers. Within a short time over 120 whales beached themselves only to die there. That evening NBC News reported that no autopsies were being performed on the whales, that this was to be left to the Smithsonian here in Washington. The next day that story was retracted, but meanwhile I know from my own sources that a high-ranking Smithsonian official who is a covert CIA agent went to Florida immediately to investigate and to make sure that the real cause of the whales beaching themselves did not become publicly known. One story the Smithsonian circulated as a possible explanation for the strange behavior of the whales was that some sort of parasites caused perhaps by pollution had caused the whales to lose their senses of depth and direction. But that, of course, does not explain why they would all have come ashore out of their natural habitat rather than wandering aimlessly at sea. And it explains even less what happened when some of the whales were towed off the beach and into the sea. In most cases they unerringly headed straight for shore and beached themselves again. Even though death awaited them on the beach, they preferred that to their natural habitat of the sea. What you have not been told, my friends, is that a number of the whales were dissected, and in practically every case their stomachs were completely empty. They were sick. But the real problem was not in their stomachs, but in their lungs, which were heavily contaminated with plutonium. A few days after the whales began beaching themselves, I was informed by my intelligence sources that the plutonium leakage from Atlantic Missile 8 had accelerated so rapidly that plutonium was now contaminating the Atlantic in a fan that touches the East Coast all the way from about halfway between Savannah and Brunswick, Georgia, southward almost to Daytona Beach, Florida. It was strongest in the middle, right where the whales came ashore near Jacksonville. My friends, I am not a marine biologist, and I don't know exactly how the whales got waterborne plutonium into their lungs, but the facts speak for themselves. Somehow it happened, and once there the plutonium produced a fungus-like infection that interfered with their breathing. Finally, in desperation, the whales, which are mammals like you and me, began casting themselves onto the beach, gasping for air. By now the whales have been collected and buried in the Gerwin Road landfill in Jacksonville, Florida, and forgotten by most as yesterday's news. But we would do well not to ignore the lesson of the beached whales, because now, like the whales, our drinking water in the United States now contains plutonium too. The Soviet injections of plutonium into our atmosphere, which began last October 1976, have continued and in fact are now accelerating, and now fallout of this material has contaminated our own drinking water nationwide. It is invisible, it is tasteless, but it is there. As I reported last month, a dramatic increase in flu-like illness was to be expected all across America thanks to the Soviet plutonium attack No. 3 which took place in late December and early January. And now it's happening. Outbreaks of, quote, flu and flu-like illnesses, unquote, have been reported this month in at least 23 states. Perhaps you yourself have had a round of something lately that seems like the flu yet may have seemed somehow different from flu you have had in the past, or perhaps you have just noticed that something is going around. Even this recording was delayed one week by flu-like illnesses which hit myself and some of my associates very hard. I wish I could tell you that the flu-like illness season were about over, but unfortunately the opposite is true. A fourth Soviet plutonium attack began this month on February the 3rd involving 25 Soviet submarines. This time they were deployed along the entire west coast, 
from Seattle to San Diego, and they injected plutonium into our atmosphere over a period of approximately two weeks. And now, just three days ago on February 24, a fifth Soviet plutonium attack on the United States has begun. This time there are 30 Soviet submarines, again deployed all the way from Seattle to San Diego. Furthermore, I am now able to confirm that there is a weather modification aspect to the Soviet plutonium attacks. In the past year or so, the United States Environmental Protection Agency, the EPA, has issued warnings, so-called, that fluorocarbon propellants from household aerosol cans are, are damaging the ozone layer far up into the atmosphere. We have been warned that this could have very dangerous effects on our environment, and as a result, a trend away from aerosol spray cans is now underway. There may be some merit to that argument, but as usual, the EPA is merely seizing on a minor danger in order to cover up a far more real immediate and major threat. The means by which the plutonium is being dispersed into our atmosphere by the Soviet submarines is none other than by fluorocarbon propellants discharging upward into the air at a steep angle. Each submarine in each attack exhausts huge quantities of fluorocarbon propellant in such a way that it is far more effective in damaging our ozone layer than millions of ordinary household aerosol cans in normal use. Even before the plutonium attacks began last October, my intelligence sources believe that fluorocarbon injections like this into our atmosphere were underway for some time. The introduction of the plutonium to these attacks last October was therefore an easy matter. But by other means also, weather modification activities by both the CIA and the Soviet KGB have been in progress for some time now for use in warfare. Because of these facts, I believe I should warn you about one thing which at this time I must label as conjecture. Normally, as you know, my policy is to tell you only those things which I have been able to confirm as established fact, but this time I believe an exception is warranted. The timing, severity, and pattern of the huge winter storm that struck the north and east portions of the United States may well have been a massive pre-war weather modification experiment as a rehearsal for similar measures in Nuclear War I. Had war broken out while those weather patterns persisted, large portions of the upper United States within the nuclear safe zone would have been immobilized by weather and therefore could have been spared from attack, seemingly for natural reasons. It may be that weather control is the key to the riddle of the nuclear safe zone, enabling it to attack, escape attack while the southern two-thirds of the United States, along with Alaska and Hawaii, endure a nuclear holocaust. If this is the case, then a future storm pattern that immobilizes the part of the United States above the 40th parallel could be the signal that a Soviet nuclear attack is imminent. I emphasize again that as of now this is conjecture on my part. I have not been able to confirm it, but there are so many facts that point in this direction that I believe you should be warned of this possibility. The Rockefeller Brothers in any case are doing everything in their power to hurry up Nuclear War I so anything can happen. They are in a hurry because they want to make sure that the war takes place while enough of their Super CIA missiles are still operational to provide an effective blackmail threat against the Soviets. But as for America's officially acknowledged fleet of intercontinental missiles, that is another matter. I have never revealed what went on when I saw General George S. Brown, Chairman of the Joint Chiefs of Staff in his Pentagon offices last September 16, 1976. But I think I should now mention just one item 
which has now acquired urgent new significance. One of the things I discussed with General Brown was the horrendous intelligence gap created by then Secretary of State Henry Kissinger. Because of this deliberate intelligence gap, General Brown and the Joint Chiefs have been denied crucial information needed to protect our country. In this connection, General Brown did not know about the super-secret nuclear safe zone negotiated for the private benefit of the Rockefeller Brothers and their intimates by Kissinger. In fact, it seemed unbelievable because he pointed out the presence of several prime targets, namely ICBM installations inside the nuclear safe zone. But now Jimmy Carter is pushing for those very ICBM sites to be shut down. That is the meaning of Carter's incredible order to General Brown at the Blair House meeting of January 12, 1977, and by that means the Rockefellers plan to make the nuclear safe zone off limits to Nuclear War One attack. Topic No. 3. Whatever the future holds for us, my friends, one thing is for sure. We are witnessing the end of an era. Politically, economically, socially, and spiritually we are entering a time of tumultuous change. But the question still remains, change in what direction? Will this be the end of the era of destructive Rockefeller control over our lives? Or will we just sit back wringing our hands and let them succeed in their plans to snuff out the era of human freedom? Might we look forward to the new era of renewed respect for nature as God in His wisdom created it? Or will we condemn ourselves by inaction to a suicidal era of ever-increasing destruction of our beautiful world? under the greedy exploitation of the Rockefeller cartel and their Soviet allies? Will the struggle that is being forced upon us lead us at last to a new dawning of the day of the individual? Or will we submit without struggle to the perfect equality of slaves in the Rockefeller Soviet world empire? My friends, it will take organized, dedicated, selfless action to sound the alarm and bring pressure to bear in time to turn away from total disaster for our land. But the hour is now so late. Where can we hope for this action to come from? If history is any guide, my friends, there is only one institution left. I have pointed out on previous occasions that what is happening in America today is a ghastly replay of what happened to Germany before World War II with one difference. Those who brought Hitler to power as a pawn are themselves coming to power here in America. With this in mind, I will now read a very rare letter to you. For reasons which will become apparent, it will be safely stored away again under lock and key by the time you hear this recording. The letter, written by a distinguished churchman, is dated October 16, 1945, and is addressed to Dr. Albert Einstein. I will now read directly from the letter, My dear Dr. Einstein, I have seen you reported as having said, quote, Being a lover of freedom, when the Revolution came in Germany, I looked to the universities to defend it knowing that they had always boasted of their devotion to the cause of truth. But no, the universities immediately were silenced. Then I looked to the great editors of the newspapers whose flaming editorials in days gone by had proclaimed their love of freedom, but they, like the universities, were silenced in a few short weeks. Only the Church stood squarely across the path of Hitler's campaign for suppressing the truth. I never had any special interest in the Church before, but now I feel a great affection and admiration 
because the Church alone has had the courage and persistence to stand for intellectual truth and moral freedom. I am forced thus to confess that what I once despised I now praise unreservedly." Unquote. Still continuing with the letter, would you be kind enough to let me know whether this represents your feeling now that hostilities have ceased? I should be very grateful to know how you feel about this now. With great admiration and every good wish I am yours faithfully, and there follows the signature of the writer. Below there is a postscript as follows, and I quote, P.S. The statement is reported to have been made by you before the United States entered the war, and I thought possibly you might have had some occasion to change your opinion in the light of later developments. I naturally hope that you have it." Unquote. The writer of this letter received it back with the following answer in longhand along the right-hand margin, and I quote, The reproduction of my verbally given statement is essentially correct and I have not changed my opinion concerning this point." Unquote. There follows the signature A. Einstein. My friends, the churches in Nazi Germany recognized the onslaught of evil and stood up against it. Today America faces the same evil multiplied a thousand times over. But where? Oh, where are the churches today? Until next month, God willing, this is Dr. Beter. Thank you, and may God bless each and every one of you.